the Jewish Channel's Week in Review. Israeli election winners and losers popping up for Passover, pre-war Polish Jewry on film, and more of the Jewish news that's changing your world right now in this episode of the Week in Review. Hello, and welcome to the Jewish Channel's Week in Review. I'm Stephen I. Weiss. This Israeli election was huge. For the first time in Israeli history, more than four million people are estimated to have voted. It's the kind of election that puts the U.S. electorate to shame, with more than 68 percent of registered voters heading to the polls. And it was a huge election for Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, who in his bid for re-election saw his Likud party receive far more votes than it has at any point since Ariel Sharon's re-election back in 2003. The booming turnout for Netanyahu confounded pollsters, who'd had the race neck and neck not only in the last published polls before the election, but in the exit polls that were revealed soon after as well. Netanyahu pushed hard and hard to the right to get there. In the days leading up to the election, Netanyahu explicitly declared there would not be a Palestinian state if he remained prime minister. Netanyahu also urged his right-wing base to vote by explicitly pushing anti-Arab sentiments. And what's abundantly clear is that these tactics worked. Netanyahu found 195,000 new voters than he had had when his current administration got started in 2009 after a huge dip in popularity in his 2013 re-election. This election was a gambit by Netanyahu in two major ways. First, in betting that in calling for early elections he could improve and not hurt his standing in the Israeli government, and then that his push for far-right votes would gain him more voters than it would lose him. Both gambits clearly paid off. But where did all of those votes come from? What changed in this election from past elections? A detailed analysis of vote counts by TJC shows how we've ended up where we are. Let's start with the right-wing camp of Netanyahu's Likud, Foreign Minister Avigdor Lieberman's Israel Beitenu Party, and Religious Services Minister Naftali Bennett's Habayit Hayudi Party. Those three combined for almost identical vote tallies in 2009 and 2013 of just over 1.2 million votes, but jumped by more than 164,000 votes in this election, driven by huge Likud gains, some of which came at the expense of Bennett and Lieberman. The biggest new factor in the election by far, though, was Moshe Kahlon's Kulanu party. It received 295,000 votes in this week's election and never existed before. In any coalition that would be formed, Kulana would be the key party to get on board, making Kahlon Israel's most important kingmaker. For all the noise about a major surge for the center-left, the parties that comprise it didn't do much better than they traditionally have. Yitzhak Herzog's and Sipi Livni's Zionist Union Party, Yair Lapid's Yesha Tid Party, and the Meretz Party got one and a quarter million votes Tuesday, about 55,000 more than they did in 2009. The joint list of Arab parties surged to more than 125,000 more votes than they received in 2009 and will be the third largest party in Israel. But the Arab parties won't be included in any coalition. Meanwhile, small parties ranging from the Greens to the We Are All Friends party cratered. Parties that received fewer than 50,000 votes each were strong in 2013, garnering more than 200,000 votes. Small parties lost three-quarters of those votes on Tuesday. The ultra-Orthodox, meanwhile, have held steady but lost some influence amid the larger turnout, in large part due to internal politics that saw breakaway parties take votes but fail to reach the threshold to be included in the upcoming Knesset. All in all, it's an Israeli electorate that has confirmed once again that it is center-right and leaning ever further right, with a prime minister gaining a resounding re-election victory by making statements and promises that are at odds with the goals of its Western allies for a peace process, a two-state solution, and greater inclusion of Israeli Arabs. Moving on from the latest in Israeli news to an examination of Jewish history in places almost devoid of Jews today, Christianin reports on an exhibition of film footage of Jews visiting pre-war Poland. These are images of a culture on the brink of destruction. Jews living in Poland in the 1920s and 30s filmed by visiting New York City Jews. Today they are on display at the Museum of the City of New York as part of the exhibition Letters to Afar, which closes at the end of March. The images are drawn from the archives of the YIVO Institute for Jewish Research, who collaborated with the Museum of the History of Polish Jews in Warsaw to commission Hungarian artist Peter Forjax to make an art installation which features music by New York City klezmer band The Klezmatics. Museum of the City of New York director Sarah Henry explained why this exhibition is worth seeing. The experience of walking through Letters to Afar I think is really striking because of what the artist has done. He's made in a way a, an invocation of village life in Poland through the use of multiple screens 
competing soundtracks and this really tender and original manipulation of the historic films. So they are both at once historical documents, but also a very human and specific artistic look at the people whose images are captured here. And it's the exhibition's approach to sound that sets it apart. So the video is accompanied by what uh, Peter Forgash calls sound showers. And in the audio that uh, pinpoints the spot of the visitor who's standing before a specific screen, within that audio is a blend of narration, um, the klezmatics, fantastic music, and other soundscape elements that make it a really haunting experience, I think. There's actually about six hours of video in there, but you could spend many more hours than that if you wanted to, immersing yourself in this world he has helped to recreate. To see more from Letters to Afar, please tune into the full broadcast edition of The Week in Review. Thank you, Christian. Passover is coming, and it's the holiday known for not letting things rise. But that doesn't mean you can't have a pop-up boutique, as Meredith Gansman reports. Passover is popping up, thanks to Manischewitz and a New York foodie mecca, Chelsea Market. A potato latke bar with multiple toppings, matzo pizza topped with fresh mozzarella and pesto, and s'mores made with chocolate-covered matzo were just a few of the food offerings at the Manischewitz Experience, a first for the kosher company. I have to tell you, people who never ate matzo before in their life are gonna go now and buy chocolate-covered matzo because it's like, I don't even miss the graham cracker. It really is awesome. Celebrity kosher chef Jamie Geller was on hand to demonstrate new recipes before Passover. We are making potato pancakes stuff with smoked salmon. Geller used Manischewitz homestyle potato mix. My grandmother always thought, okay, you need to get blood, sweat, and nails into the latkes to be good. Here's a nice shortcut that's delicious. Chef Katsuji Tanabe, owner of Mexico Sure in Los Angeles, and a recent contestant on Bravo's Top Chef Boston, is also a fan of the Manischewitz products. So I especially like the canned goods, like the sardines. I, I bring it to my house and I show it to people, and people are like, oh my God, they're so good. Where are from? So like Manischewitz. They're like, oh my God. They're like, I, I didn't think they make something else besides one. And I don't know, I'm proud of using their, uh, their stuff. It's so good. Tanabi's restaurant will be open during Passover, serving his signature dishes that incorporate strong layers of flavors. Korean, uh, Korean short ribs. Because uh, they, they don't, you know, they're all kosher for Passover. And I actually, even after Passover, I still sell them at my restaurant. For more on the Manischewitz experience, tune into the full broadcast version of the Week in Review. Thank you, Meredith. Finding out what goes into a Broadway production is about more than going behind the scenes. A veteran press agent's new book is reported on by Meredith Gansman for a segment from our theater show, Row J. Look, look, I mean, Billy Crystal, Debbie Reynolds, Neil Patrick Harris, mm -hmm. um, Thornton, a, a book about Thornton Wilder, um, <laughs> Martin Short. It was funny, last night we this is like a bad Me! <laughs> Theater press agent Susan Shulman's backstage pass to Broadway is in good company. I'm a fan kid like everybody else. I loved Mary Martin, and she was kind of my first Broadway fan crush. And I was just a, a fan. I was just a kid who wrote her letters. Um, at the beginning. Shulman's book chronicles her more than 40 years as a press agent on Broadway, beginning with her work on the musical Applause, starring Lauren Bacall. And one day I was called into the producer's office and they said the only person that Betty Bacall will work with in the Bill Dahl office is Susan Shulman, which was crazy. I mean, I was 23, I was a little kid. And any theater professional, Shulman says, should be able to answer this question. Are you anyone? Because you're standing in a dressing room and you're talking to your, the actor who's mm -hmm. starring in your show and you're standing behind them at the dressing table and you're looking in the mirror and you're looking at them all in, made up, looking wigged and draped and looking gorgeous. And behind them is little pathetic you, you know, looking ordinary. And it's, it can be a crusher mm -hmm. if you don't have a sense of who you are and what your worth is. One larger than life personality went too far. That's Shulman with Zero Mistel, who was about to star in The Merchant before his untimely death. When we were in rehearsals for The Merchant, Q Magazine, which ultimately turned into New York Magazine, but Q mm -hmm. Magazine wanted to feature Zero Mistel on its cover. So I set up a photo shoot in, um, in Q's photo studio and they shot Zero Z, as he was called, sitting on a stool for the cover. 
And when it was over, the photographer said, let's take a picture of all the people that made this happen. Mm -hmm. And so there was his dresser and some, some lighting assistants, some photography assistants, and myself. And so we all thought, oh, this will be fun. So we all jumped in and we sort of posed around Z, who was sitting on a stool. And I knelt down next to him. And just before the shutter clicked, for absolutely no reason, he reached down and grabbed my breast. And I, I was a kid. I was, not that it mattered how old I was, I was horrified. But what was I going to do? So I kind of shoved his hand away as the, the camera clicked. And that's the picture. For more from Susan Shulman's backstage pass to Broadway, tune into the full broadcast version of the Week in Review. Thank you, Meredith. Finally, this week on Up Close, we tend to hear a lot of people telling others how to live their lives, emphasizing the need for personal responsibility. In this week's episode, we'll move across 2,000 years of history to see some of the origins of that discussion of personal responsibility and its cost today. The philosopher Seneca is the original source of much of our dialogue around being self-made and pulling oneself up by one's bootstraps. But it turns out he was born into wealth and privilege. The University of Pennsylvania's Emily Wilson explores that in her book, The Greatest Empire, A Life of Seneca. And then, among those whom our society regards as taking the least personal responsibility are drug addicts, who are frequently treated like criminals. Journalist Johan Hari gives some reasons why they shouldn't be in Chasing the Scream, the first and last days of the war on drugs. Here are some of the highlights from my interview with Emily Wilson. So what is The Greatest Empire and how do we conquer it? <laughs> yes, yeah, so the, 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 the title is based on a pun which I think is really important in Seneca's work and in Seneca's life. The, what he says is that the greatest empire is to be emperor over oneself. Um, so he's looking within his philosophical writings and within his Stoic philosophy for having um, control or empire over his own um, irrational desires, over irrational emotions, over impulses towards consumerism, bad kinds of habits, um, and instead having complete control by being a good person, a virtuous person. So that's one kind of control that he wants, one kind of empire. But then, of course, the other kind of empire is the kind of empire that the Emperor Nero had, and that he's trying to get, he was also in being political advisor to Nero, speechwriter to Nero, PR person for Nero. He wanted that kind of empire as well. Interestingly, the, the Senecan philosophy uh, is, is very popular in modern times, mm -hmm. and I think for a lot of the same reasons that it might be, uh, that it might have been then, which is to say when you have an opportunity, to, to have a lot of what you want. Mm -hmm. What then is left for you uh, to, to, to figure out? Mm -hmm. The question that lurks in Seneca's work is, what is it that you really want? What is really, really going to be happiness? What is, what is it truly to be a king? What is it really to be powerful? And on some level, really being powerful means the good, the good life and not actually bothering about material wealth. But on another level, really being powerful means exactly what you think it means. It means being the richest man in Rome. You can see the full episode of Up Close on the Jewish channel on cable. You can also listen to the full audio of Up Close as a podcast available on iTunes or in your favorite podcast player. That's all for this week. From all of us here at the Jewish Channel, be well. The Jewish Channel is available on cable, Time Warner Cable Channel 1640, Iowa Channel 505, RCN Channel 268, Cox Cable Channel 1, Bright House Channel 330, Verizon Fios Channel 900, and on Comcast on the on-demand menu on TV. For more information, visit TJCTV.com.